So welcome everyone. I'm so glad to see all of your faces. Uh, how many people, 25 people on the Zoom tonight? That's great. I expect a few more people will be joining us over the next few minutes. I'm Juliette Berger. I'm president of your Washtenaw Audubon Society. I'm very grateful to be able to still see you and to still uh, be able to share tonight's fabulous program with Matt Hack with you. Despite that uh, COVID numbers are going up, we can still be together in some form. Um, as I do at the beginning of all of our programs, I, I like to talk about the Washtenaw Audubon diversity, equity and inclusion policy and statement. Um, we've been working really hard over the last few years to try and help um, everyone feel welcome. And so I want to tell you that the Birds Washington Audubon pledges to protect differ in color, size, behavior, geographical preference in countless other ways. And as we honor and celebrate the equally remarkable diversity of the human species, Washington Audubon considers the work of inclusion, diversity and equity a top priority moving forward. We hope that in doing so, we can bring new creativity and energy to our work in Washtenaw County and beyond for birds and people alike. Um, now respect, inclusion and opportunity for people of all backgrounds, lifestyles and perspectives will attract the best ideas and harness the greatest passion to shape a healthier, more vibrant future for all of us who share our planet. We believe that protecting and conserving nature and the environment transcends political, cultural and social boundaries as an organization, we are committed to increasing the diversity of our board, our volunteers, members, and supporters. As an organization, Washington Audubon strives to create a sense of community where all people can feel safe to explore nature and experience the wonder of birds. We respect the individuality of each mem member of our community and welcome all without discrimination based on race, color, religion, sex, age, sexual orientation, gender identity and expression, disability, national or ethnic origin, politics, veteran status, or any other status. All are welcome to bird with us and learn with us and to share our passion for birds and the environment. So again, welcome everyone to Washington Audubon's January program. We were talking a little bit at the beginning about interesting bird sightings that we've had around the area. And uh, Sue Clinton brought up wondering where there's open water where we could see some ducks. And uh, Jim Coppin said the Detroit River is open and the Huron River is open between Mitchell Field and uh, Gallup. There's lots of ducks in there. Matt Spore, our field trip chair, just led a trip there last weekend and they saw they saw a lot of interesting ducks. Um, and I know there's red poles all along the river um, at Gallup, Furstenberg, uh, up at Foster right before I left and uh, listen for their fun and lively calls and look for them feeding in alder tree cones. Um, what else are we seeing? I heard about a rough-legged hawk somewhere, Freeland and Gottfordson, somewhere like that. Anybody have any other good bird sightings? We're all muted, so. We're all muted. Ah, that's no fun. I heard there was a, um, there have been some interesting gulls at the Salem landfill. So if you get up into Salem Township on Six Mile Road, you might find a place to stop and put a scope on the landfill. Uh, there have been a glaucous gull, some great, back, back, great black backed. Um, lesser black-backed, and also some of these birds have showed up at Ford Lake. I don't know if Ford Lake is still open because I've been gone for a couple of weeks. It might have frozen over. Um, other announcements. The newsletter is coming out soon, so look for that in your mailbox and your inbox it should be out within the next week. It's done. I think it went to the printer today. Um, 
Julia, I can mention yes. um, the Toei was mentioned, but I also want to well, mention right. there was a horn grebe seen at North Hydro Park yesterday morning. In Ypsilanti. In Ypsilanti. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Yeah, there's a Toei along the B2B somewhere across from Furstenberg. And so I think, Matt, it's up to you to announce what field trips, field trips we have coming going forward. Matt Spore is our field trip chair, and he's got a lot of good things in store for us. Yeah, so I guess first I'll mention that all of these field trips can be found on the WashingtonAudubon.org website. Um, and there's convenient um, features there to add them to your calendar. So um, you can add all of our events to your calendar, or you can just do them one at a time. Um, which is always a good idea so you don't miss or forget. Um, also on our Facebook page, um, the events are there as well. And their handy feature there is you can say that you're interested in that event and then it'll pop up a reminder later. And it'll also um, help um, share it with other people and let them know what we have going on. Um, I also wanna mention that our Twitter account has been more active lately. So if you're someone that's on Twitter, um, I've been posting events and updates and rare bird um, sightings there, along with the Facebook Birding Washington page. And of course, um, our Facebook page um, that Juliet um, does such a great job of updating along with some others. Specifically about um, field trips coming up, basically every other weekend, we've, we've typically got something going on. So um, the 23rd, which is this weekend, yeah, Sunday the 23rd, we'll be having a, a walk at Mathai, which I'm really looking forward to. It's always fun at Mathai. There's so many great things to see and usually lots of bluebirds singing, even if it's a little cold out. Um, then on the 6th of February, we'll be at Ford Lake, um, hoping to get some cool gulls and some waterfowl there. Um, I Also on February 12th, my birthday, um, Victor Chen, our education chair, will be leading, uh, and I'll, I hope to be there as well, a BIPOC walk. Um, for those of you not familiar with the term BIPOC, it stands for Black, Indigenous, and People of Color. And it's going to be, um, it's something that, that Victor's been trying to do to, to sort of reach out to um, non-traditional communities, for example. He, we had a um, partnered with the Ipsy Library and did a duck walk um, for folks in Ypsilanti, an area that we don't get to enough. Um, so anyway, we'll be doing this BIPOC walk uh, on February 12th, Saturday. And then the following weekend, um, uh, the weekend of February 19th, we are planning on our reviving our UP trip. Um, so we're, let me go back where I can see faces, there we go. Um, we're staying a little bit fluid with this. Uh, obviously a lot depends on realities on the ground as we start getting closer to that event with COVID. Um, right now, the plan is we're going to, um, we're trying to keep it to around 20 people. It's full right now, um, but there definitely, I would bet anything there'll be people that will drop off. And we may also increase that number slightly depending on what the vehicle situation is like. Really our limiting factor with this trip is we don't want a ton of vehicles in a caravan because um, if you get 10 vehicles, it just makes for a bad experience for a lot of people. So it's gonna kind of depend on that, but we'll be around that 20 mark. Um, you know, worst case scenario, if COVID is still raging like it is now, uh, we may uh, just all kind of free for all, go up there and have a birding trip with your particular group and have a Zoom party afterwards and talk about what we saw. Um, we're not 100% sure, but we're gonna stay fluid. Um, and if things uh, continue to improve, um, we'll, we'll have the trip. We may require folks to, to take a, an antigen test the day before. I don't know, all this is fluid, but we, are, we do have the UP trip coming up and we're gonna try to do it safely if we can. Um, and I'm willing to answer questions about that. I'm sure people have, have a lot of questions. After that UP trip uh, on the 26th, we'll be back at the ARB for another, another bird walk. And lastly, I wanted to mention um, in, on March 12th, we'll be doing the One Road Challenge again. And for those that aren't familiar with One Road Challenge, it's, it's a lot of fun. So, uh, and 
Julia, speak up if I forget any details, but essentially you, you get a team together um, of three people. Um, can we do two or is it, do we require three? I think three it's three or more. Yeah. yeah, three or more, yeah. And so you pick one road in, in Washtenaw County and you bird that road from sometime after midnight until 11 a.m. Uh, and get as many birds as you can see along that road. Everybody has to see or hear the bird in your group and there's special points given to, um, if you bring somebody who's never been to a Washington Audubon event, if, you, if they're part of your team, you get extra points for that. So we have traditionally said that half the people in your group have to see or hear the bird. So if oh, you have three, have then two of you have to see it. The rules yeah. are on the website if you're interested. The rules in are fluid, but yeah. yeah. But they're, they're written, I think I put all the rules up there. But, um, and then I will say too, if you're interested in doing that um, and you don't have a team or don't think you'll be wanting to put a team together, you can still sign up and just indicate that you'd like to be placed with a team. Um, and that's something that we can, we can do as well. Um, I've done this a couple of times, it's, it's a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. So that's all I've got. Thanks, Matt. Yeah. I'm looking forward to as many of these trips as I can attend or help with. Um, I think I'll be there on Sunday with you at Math Eye. Yeah. Um, I guess we're, we're talking about our upcoming programs. Are you there, Mike? You are. I am, yes. Um, next month, March. No, February. Oh, be before you February. before you start, do we have Diana Miller on here? I thought I saw her name. No, I don't see Diana. No, no. Oh, we have a new membership chair. I'm hoping you'll all get to meet her soon. Sorry for sorry for interrupting, Mike. Uh, no problem. Um, in February, we have Andy Johnson uh, from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. Uh, talking about a newly discovered stopover spot for whimbrels, uh, big shorebirds in South Carolina. Uh, Andy is a video producer at uh, Cornell, and he is a former hotshot young birder, just like Matt Hatt is, who's giving us our talk tonight. Uh, Andy will be showing us some of his video from that uh, new site that's been discovered in South Carolina as well as some of his photographs. Uh, in uh, March, uh, Keith Dickey, uh, Washington Audubon's president, or damn, excuse me, Juliet, uh, Washington Audubon's treasurer uh, will talk about the birds of the American Southwest. Uh, he has lots of good photographs of them. Uh, in April, thanks to the efforts of Victor Chin, our education chair, uh, we'll have a, two speakers, uh, I believe uh, from the University of Wisconsin, if I'm not mistaken, uh, who will be talking about diversity in birding, uh, encouraging diversity and equity. Um, let's see, May, we do not yet have a speaker. And in June, uh, the ever fascinating Don the Man Chalfant will give us another one of his talks. Uh, that's it. You're muted. I'm, I'm muted and it's time to introduce our tonight's speaker. We're so excited to have Matt Hack. Uh, would you introduce him for us, Mike? Sure. Uh, Matt uh, is one of our uh, most skilled young birders. Uh, she, he grew up in Washington, Ottoman, and uh, finally became much more competent than any of us in uh, identifying <laughs> birds and finding birds. Uh, along with his younger brother, Ben Hack. Um, he uh, graduated from Yale and uh, is now working on a PhD at the University of Michigan uh, under, uh, with the advice of uh, Ben Winger, uh, the chair of the Department of Ornithology at U of M. Uh, please welcome Matt Hack. Thank you, Mike, for that introduction. And thank you all so much for having me and being here today. 
Um, I'm going to share my screen real quick. Um, and we will test if everyone has access. Everyone got it? Awesome. So today I'm going to be uh, telling you about um, basically how I spent the past year before I moved back to Ann Arbor. Um, I was in uh, Maryland and I'm especially going to be talking about the summer field work that I did of monitoring common and least turn populations on Poplar Island in the Chesapeake Bay of Maryland. Um, and this is just to start off a picture of me on Poplar Island at the, my first day of the field season. Um, so last year, um, from August 2020 to August 2021, I was living in Laurel, Maryland, and I worked at the Patuxent Research Refuge, which I've highlighted in that red circle there. Uh, you can see that Patuxent is basically the biggest swath of green space between Baltimore and DC, which is otherwise a very built up uh, metropolitan corridor. But Patuxent is about uh, 20,000 acres of pretty much untouched land that has a pretty illustrious history of scientific research. They actually were pretty pivotal in uh, whooping crane uh, captive breeding efforts. So there were a whole known as D, another D. Uh, she studies a whole variety of things, including um, disease ecology and the spread of disease in uh, waterfowl, both in North America and Asia. But I was mostly involved in her turn research. Um, that lab is um, kind of the primary caretakers and monitors of the population of terns that live on Poplar Island. Um, this is a picture of what Patuxent looks like, by the way. It has a lot of these um, little lakes uh, surrounded by forest, but um, this is Poplar Island in orange. Um, so we've zoomed out a little bit from the Baltimore DC area. It's that little island in the Chesapeake Bay right off of the eastern shore of Delmarva. Um, and this is a map of Poplar, but it's a little bit out of date. Um, and that's because there is more land constantly being added to Poplar Island. Um, this is a relatively recent aerial of what Poplar looks like these days. And for those of you who've been to Point Mouye State Game Area, you might recognize the format of this sort of land. Um, Poplar is broken into cells the same way that Point Mu is. Um, and Poplar is a completely man-made island, but uh, now on the footprint of a uh, once upon a time natural island that essentially eroded into the Chesapeake. Um, and this is what Poplar looks like these days. Um, it's been pretty much completely reconstructed over the last 20 years, but Poplar has a fascinating history. Um, it Matt, sorry, it's Jessica. Can I jump in one second? I'm so sorry to, yeah. to interrupt. I think when you shared your screen, you were sharing, I think you're sharing your full um, your full screen and not just your um, presentation tab. So we're seeing a little bit of a gray box on the right where it looks like it might be your Zoom chat and your Zoom control panel oh, at the top. Um, yeah, if you just minimize that and move it up to the top, that's perfect. Thank you. Sorry, I didn't realize that part was sharing. <laughs> no, 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 it's um, fine. It's, it's sharing as a gray box, but it's just cutting off part of your pictures and I didn't want people to lose it. So thank you. Um, thank you for letting me know. Oh, it's not letting me um, go back a slide, unfortunately. There we go. Um, everyone can see it okay now? I'm going to take that as a yes. Um, and yeah, so Poplar used to be a relatively normal island of about a thousand acres on the Chesapeake. Um, its first historical moment was that it was a campsite for British warships in the War of 1812. Um, and even as early as the 19th century, there was erosion going on in the islands in the Chesapeake and Poplar split into three smaller islands. Uh, but in the um, late 19th century, it became a stable community called Valent uh, of about 100 people. And 
Um, that community persisted into the early 20th century, but at that point, most people ended up moving to the mainland and the community essentially dissolved. Um, but Poplar experienced the second life as a really good place to go drink and hide your alcohol during prohibition. Um, and even once prohibition ended, um, a presidential clubhouse was built on Poplar. So FDR and Truman both spent some time there. Um, but eventually the clubhouse burned down and Poplar became completely abandoned again. Um, and by the 90s, erosion had pretty much completely sent Poplar into the Chesapeake. Um, so this diagram on the left shows in orange the original footprint of Poplar. And the green is how much land was actually left in the 90s. And that's an aerial image taken of Poplar during the 90s, where it's just about a few acres of tree that's quickly sinking into the ocean, um, which led to a very unlikely partnership between uh, environmental agencies who were really keen on protecting this habitat because it was home to so many um, species of water birds that breed in the Chesapeake region. Uh, they had an interest in not letting all of these islands dissolve into the Chesapeake. They found a partnership with the Federal Army Corps who needed a place to store the dredged material that they had been collecting from the Baltimore Harbor. Um, they just needed some place to put this dredged material. And they partnered with these environmental agencies to um, convert the dredged material into land reconstruction on the footprint of the original Poplar Island. And for the past 25 years, Poplar has been gradually reconstructed. Um, so you can see on the left, that's how much Poplar there was in 1997. And uh, they have pretty much put land back where uh, land originally was, and they're still expanding it today. So I think it's not going to be complete for another 20 years or so. Um, I'm just going to go through a few pictures of what Poplar looks like today. Um, most of the cells are pretty filled in at this point and have become marshland. This is the harbor. Uh, you can see the um, rather early times of day that we made it to the island occasionally. Um, and then by the time the sun was visible, we were usually on the island. These are the roads that we traveled down. And you can see those, um, there's a, like a river coursing through the wetlands there. That's um, sort of showing you the boundaries of these artificial islands that have been constructed within the islands. Um, that's where most of the birds breed. And as you travel around Poplar, you can see these barges, which had been put in to preserve the last remaining bits of land. And now the marshes to this day have pretty much been built around those barges. So that's what Poplar looks like, but Poplar also looks like this. Um, it's still being expanded pretty actively and there was never a day that we were out there and the construction workers were not. So they are still creating new cells, many of which are just pits of water in the middle at the moment. Um, and sometimes we had to wait a little bit to get our truck around the construction vehicles. That's a, um, the woman in the front there is a civil engineer who is talking to the construction workers to get the vehicle out of the way. Um, today, there are three teams of biologists who work out at Poplar over the summer. I was with the US Geological Survey. We were in charge of the terns. Um, most of the other um, general water bird work out there was through the Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, who we worked very closely with. And we did not work super closely with uh, who we dubbed the Turtle Crew, a team of Ohio University researchers who were out there to study the diamondback terrapins on the island. And they rode around in a buggy and sang songs to each other. So they had a different popular experience than we did, but we like to look at the turtles with them. Um, and so the main birds that we focused on were the common tern and the least tern. Um, but there's actually a pretty interesting diversity of birds that breed on poplar and it's representative of what has historically bred on um, the uh, islands in the Chesapeake. Um, so besides the terns, there are a lot of wading birds that breed out there, especially snowy egrets and cattle egrets. Um, mixed into the snowy and cattle colonies, we also had 
little blue heron, tricolored heron, black crown night heron, and glossy ibis. Interestingly, not great egret and great blue heron. Uh, we did see a yellow crown night heron poking around with them a couple of times. Um, and uh, there are a lot of ospreys that breed out there these days. They are constantly flying around and making a lot of noise. And a couple thousand double crested cormorants. Then some of the other uh, big breeding non passerines of interest are American black duck, which um, have a big stronghold in the Chesapeake. A lot of black neck stilts, which tended to breed pretty closely with the terns, and a lot of willets as well. Not very many passerines out there, but when we did see passerines that weren't red winged blackbirds, they tended to be pretty interesting. Um, so some of the primary passerines you could find out there were marsh wren, bank swallow, blue grosbeak, and seaside sparrow, um, which was a fun combination. I think by the end of the summer, I had seen 108 species of birds on poplar. Um, but most of our time was spent in the tern habitat. So this is an image of what common terns like to breed in. Uh, they like this sort of slightly vegetated habitat with a lot of shells and sand. Those are common terns flying around in the background. Um, large scrapes of exposed ground on those artificially created islands um, within poplar that essentially had a moat surrounding them, which made the terns feel somewhat safer. We tended to get over that moat by taking these little rowboats and kayaks. Um, this is also what common turn habitat looks like. So it is a pretty similar experience, honestly, to walking down the paths in Point Moo. Um, as the summer progressed, this is more what the common turn habitat looked like, um, which gets very overgrown, which makes for good camouflage for chicks once there are chicks out on the island. They tended to hide behind those little patches of vegetation. Least terns preferred slightly different habitat. This is what least tern habitat looks like. Um, they liked to breed on anything that vaguely resembled a um, sandy, flat, exposed beach. Uh, they did not like vegetation at all. Um, they also liked these little mud puddles, and they would put their nests annoyingly on the little bits of exposed mud within the puddles. So we had a fun time traversing those. So we first started going out to Poplar Island in May, and the terns have arrived back in the Chesapeake at this point, and they're flying around, making a lot of noise, but they haven't mostly started nesting. So we're not looking for eggs at first, we're looking for uh, turn tracks and places where they might have made a scrape. So you can see those are turn tracks there. Um, and that little hole beneath that black bit, that is where a turn um, lay down on the ground and moved around a little bit to make an, a very minimal low effort nest. <clears throat> so we started by just searching for those scrapes because it told us where the turns were going to lay their eggs. Um, so as soon as we found those scrapes, we started putting down um, wooden stakes, labeling wherever we found scrapes. And then um, we started to record whenever there were eggs that we found in the scrape. So what this is saying is this is the 187th common turn nest we found that summer. C-O-T-E is the banding code for common turn. And there were two common turn eggs at that point. Um, and we were entirely counting adult turns and marking nests and monitoring how many eggs were in each nest through the month of May until we found our first chick on uh, June 4th. So that is a, a least turn that's probably a few hours old. Uh, it's completely helpless at this point. And we um, took a picture of it. We did not take this bird back to band because it was too young. And whenever you can see exposed skin on the back, that means you have to leave the bird there. But believe it or not, this least turn is probably ready to be running around in a matter of two days. The least turns are incredible at running away from us. Um, so once June started, once there was one chick, there was a whole explosion of chicks. So when we went through the colony, in addition to marking all of the eggs and the nests that we found, we marked the chicks by uh, picking them up and then bringing them back to our banding table where we put um, two bands on them. So that's a 
least turn that's probably two or three days old. And it's a little bit hard to see, but on its um, right leg is a metal band, which is the federal band. That is how the bird is registered with the government, essentially. It's almost like a bird social security code. And that left one is um, a three digit black and white band, which is much easier to read through a scope if you want to know which bird specifically you're seeing in adulthood. So this is what we would see uh, if we came up to a nest and the bird had just hatched. That's a very recently hatched common turn. Um, its two siblings hadn't even um, hatched yet. Turns tend to lay a single egg a day until they decide they've laid enough eggs, which is usually when they've laid three if they're a common turn or two if they're a least turn. Um, and then we take the turns back and that's a better picture of what the um, what the second band looks like. So if you were to um, scope this bird as an adult and see that it was VA9, if you reported that band, um, the federal ornithologist would be able to track which bird that was and that it originally came from Poplar Island in summer 2021. This is a common turn once it's gotten a bit older. So this bird is now probably at least 10 days old. Um, and we kept going through the colonies and picking up birds even that we had banded before. Um, this bird we happen to have not banded as you can see from the lack of bands, but most of the birds at that age we had picked up at that point, but we still kept marking them to say that they were still alive and kicking and to get an estimate of what percentage of previously banded birds we were finding each day that we went into the colonies. This is a common turn as it's getting a little bit older. And eventually, when they're between two or three weeks old, they have pretty impressive looking wings. So we also monitored whether the turns um, had fledged to see how many made it from the egg to actual flying. And to test whether or not the bird had fledged, um, if it was in our hand and it looked like it might be able to fly, you gave it a gentle toss over the ground and saw if it um, took flight or not. Uh, they tended to be okay if they hit the ground, they landed on their feet and ran away in disgust, but many of them did fly away and then we would mark them as a fledged bird. And even once most of the chicks had fledged, we kept going through the colonies to see which ones were hanging around by scoping them and reading those black and white bands. This is a least turn at about two days old. So that's how big their chicks are at first. And then this is a least turn when it's about um, closer to five or six days old. And I don't really have pictures of least turns older than that because unlike the common turns, which bumble away from you and hide behind pieces of grass, the least turns take off the second they realize you're in the colony. And after a few days old, you are unlikely to ever see those birds again. So we tried to time the colony trips to when the turns were about two days hatched uh, because then they were big enough to band without possibly harming them, but not completely able to escape us. So some of the fonder memories of the summer are chasing after runaway least turns in a desperate attempt to ban them. I included a couple of blooper turns as well, um, because after taking hundreds of turn pictures, uh, sometimes they decided to be funny. And sometimes I was able to capture moments of aggression as well. This was a common experience, but it does not really hurt. It's um, more an act of desperation. But what did hurt was all of the adult turns, specifically common turns that dive bomb you and hit your head over the course of the summer, which is why we usually wore um, big straw hats and put, um, and put those wooden stakes in the hat so that the turns would aim for those wooden stakes instead of our scalps. After we banded the turns, we put them back in those paper bags, which is how we transported them to uh, make sure they didn't get out um, in transit. And then they usually didn't run too far away from us once we put them back because they camouflage pretty well if they're common turns. So that's a turn chick right there, blending in very well with the sand. Or in the case of least turns, they mostly just rely on running away. So when they're too small to run away, they exercise some excellent island survival instincts by hiding behind little rocks that they completely are too big to fit behind. And it's really adorable. 
Here's a few pictures of me banding the turns. That's me with a common turn on the left and me with a least turn on the right. Um, if you're wondering what happened to the hat from the left point to the right point over the course of the summer, the answer is common turn bills. Also, the neon vest is so that the construction workers can't miss us as we're going around from turn colony to turn colony. We also trapped and banded a number of adult turns. And the reason that we did that is to radio tag them. So um, the lab that I was working in was also interested in getting started on an adult turn uh, telemetry project, which means um, tagging the birds with those radio tags and um, seeing where the signal gets picked up um, in the future to uh, track the movements of these turns. So one of the big projects this summer that I was a little bit less involved in was setting out traps for the adult turns at their nest and then tagging them. But I also want to give you a little bit of a glimpse into just what it looked like to see the team at work. So this is a few of my lab mates and other scientists uh, setting up that trap for the adult turns while also returning chicks. And I think this slightly captures the chaos and movement that typically defined our uh, going through the colonies. Here's my lab mate uh, getting set up in a hunting blind to observe some turns. This is the back of the truck that we rode around in um, to get from point A to point B on the island filled with all of our gear, including that white bucket up there, which was basically my lifeline over the summer because it contained all the data. And here's me riding around on the back of the truck trying to squeeze lunch in as we rode from one colony to another. Um, when we went to Poplar, it was usually about three days a week and we got there around 5.45 or 6 a.m. And depending on where we were in the season, we could have left at any point between like 1 and 4 p.m. And then on those off days, I came home with all of this data and my interns and I inputted and analyzed the data on the off days. Um, and that was the routine of what I did this summer, but we also got some special occasions and experiences with other birds in there as well. We were keeping an eye on the waders and um, the egrets and herons and ibises that nested on poplar as well. So we weren't banding them, but we did periodic counts of the numbers of adults. And we also went onto their breeding habitat islands a couple of times to monitor how many chicks and eggs we could find. So these are a couple pictures of the habitat that the egrets and herons preferred. They liked more vegetation, like those small trees and shrubs because they um, nested in the range of five to six feet above the ground. That's not a real snowy egret on the right, it's a decoy because all of the actual herons and ibises had been flushed up at that point. Those are real glossy ibises flying over us. Um, and when we got to these islands, we basically crawled through the vegetation and then stood up whenever we found a nest to see what was inside the nest. So this is um, either a snowy or a cattle egret nest. And it's pretty much impossible to tell. Um, and believe it or not, that chick is alive. Um, it is a couple of hours old and its um, nest mates hadn't hatched yet. Um, and it's pretty impossible at this age to tell apart the snowy and cattle egrets. Um, so to do a relative um, estimate of the cattle and snowies, we marked all of these sorts of nests as representing either cattle or snowy egret, and then using the number of adult birds that we counted, basically extrapolated the number of nests. This is what a glossy ibis nest looks like. Um, and this is me going through the colony, so this shows you kind of the density of what we're working with. And the reason that I have spray paint is because um, after I counted each nest, I spray painted a little orange mark on the tree underneath the nest, which was a signal to my lab mates of, don't count this one, I already got it. We also spent some time with the cormorants. This was more under the domain of um, Fish and Wildlife Service. In normal years, there might've been a couple hundred cormorants nesting, but we had more like 2000. And the reason for that is because in normal years, uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service 
goes out to the island and um, they do not shoot the cormorants, but they fire the guns in the general vicinity of the cormorants um, to deter them from nesting because they have a habit of taking over the Karen and egret nesting sites. And there are just so many more of them than there used to be. But um, there was a pandemic and they did not get out there on time this year. So this is what the cormorant flocks looked like. This is not my picture. This is a fish and wildlife picture. Uh, there were a couple thousand of them. So a few times over the course of the summer, we went out on this little rowboat to the cormorant colony and the cormorants all took off and yelled at us. And we walked up to each of their nests, which looked like this. Those are all very young baby cormorants, which are extremely dinosaur-like. And we counted the number of cormorant babies. As we uh, moved around the island, sometimes we would run into unexpected uh, surprises like this baby black neck stilt that was hanging out with the terns. And sometimes we even got to hang out with other wildlife like this massive water snake that my lab mate unwisely picked up or the diamondback terrapins, which the turtle crew worked on and which are very cool types of turtles. Um, and I wanted to uh, last show you a particular treat, which was not on Poplar Island. It was further down in the Chesapeake. Um, but as a reward essentially for our hard work over the course of the summer, my lab took a trip to Southeast Maryland and got on a boat to a different island where it was full of pelicans. So this is what uh, super young baby pelicans look like but this doesn't do justice to the sheer chaos on this pelican island. We're gonna hope this video plays. So this is what we experienced on Pelican Day. We boated out to this island um, where there were several hundred nesting pairs of brown pelicans and all of the adults took off and flew around, but the young, which were pretty large, like essentially pelican sized at this point, but not yet flying, clustered into these massive flocks and just screamed at us and started chomping with their bills, but at such a slow pace that what you could do was grab their bill and pick them up. This is the crew um, trying to box in the pelicans so that we could start picking them up and banding them. There's a single adult that for some reason hadn't taken off in the front. And we managed to also box in a couple of cormorants in the back, but mostly this is a whole bunch of juvenile brown pelicans. And then we went into the flock and started picking up pelicans. And unlike with the turns, where it's a very um, meticulous process where you record a lot of data and you take weights, you take measurements, this is what they call a ring and fling, where you put a band on the pelican as quickly as possible and then let it go. Um, and these were some unwieldy creatures. So a lot of the photos I took that day looked like this, um, but I got a couple of them to pose for long enough that I got some pelican shots. Those are the adults in the background flying around wondering what is going on. Um, and this picture I thought just encapsulated the chaos of Pelican Day because you can see one behind me snapping up at the person. You can see someone in the top left running away with the pelican who she has in a very strange grip. Uh, this was a massive highlight of the summer. Um, but the biggest takeaway was still with the turns. This was definitely the coolest field experience I've ever gotten to be a part of. It was the first time I'd ever worked with live birds. I'd never um, banded this way before. Most of my work with um, holding birds involved um, specimens at the Natural History Museum. And it was also just incredible to see this um, particular conservation success story and active conservation work in action and to be a part of that. And I wanted to leave the rest of the time for you all to ask me questions. Um, about any of my experience or about poplar or about these birds. And thank you all so much for being here tonight. Thank you so much, Matt. Um, we have a few questions that are already in the chat. 
that I can um, ask you. Um, so Dawn Sports asks us, how does the weight of the bands compare to that of the bird, for example, on the least turn or the common turn? Mm -hmm. um, so I think the general rule is that they shouldn't be more than about 2% of the bird's body weight. So we're talking like individual, um, like less than a gram for each band, it essentially weighs nothing. Because the, the goal is for the bird to not really feel it at all. And can I follow that up with, it looked like the bands on the, the newly hatched least turns were pretty tight. Do they expand as their leg grows a bit or how does that work? Yeah, that's a really good question. And um, the turns, unlike uh, passerines that are in the nest, the turns, even though they look pretty helpless when they're just hatched, they um, can move around by foot pretty quickly. And that necessitates their legs growing to pretty close to their ultimate width. Um, however, the least turns, sometimes we did find random least turn bands lying around because we tried to ban them so young that they're, um, and the bands only go as tight as um, can fit around an adult turn for the most part. Um, you can force it a little bit tighter than that, but it's not very good for the bird ultimately. So we tried to be conscientious of that. That led to a couple of times where the least turns managed to fling off their bands because they gave us a hard time in general. Um, but the legs are pretty close to adult size right from the get-go is the short answer. Mm -hmm. Great, good answer. Um, also, I was wondering, um, how did you get out to uh, Poplar Island? Yep. So we, um, we went each morning, I drove to um, a larger island, which is mostly an offshoot of the Eastern shore called Kent Island. And there was a marina at Kent Island where we took a government motorboat each day mm. to the island. Cool. Um, Kathy Tyson asks, um, she really, she says she really enjoyed hearing the history of rebuilding Poplar Island and she assumes it's not open to the public. Is so that the case? A couple times a year, the Maryland Environmental Department leads public tours out there. Um, mm. It does have to be on a specific tour, but if you can get out there, I'd recommend it just because it's such a um, bizarre ecosystem mm -hmm. and a really interesting human engineering feat. Very cool. Uh, and Lee asked, do you have a project planned for the summer of 22? As of yet, no. I'm hoping that I can be a part of the um, Ben Winger Lab field expedition, should we be lucky enough for those to occur. They like to go up to northern Michigan or Canada over the summer to do um, breeding songbird field data. Um, We'll see how the pandemic shapes up. Um, so I'm not super holding my breath, but mm -hmm. um, right now I'm more in the project formulation stage. So um, I think hopefully by next summer, I'll be like summer 2023, um, my projects will be a little bit more uh, tailored towards my PhD work. Mm -hmm. Good answer. Um, Sue Clinton asks, were the terns free of predators on Poplar Island? No, they were not. Um, yeah. And um, despite the best efforts of the Fish and Wildlife Service who go out there each winter to remove the great horned owls that set up shop as well as the foxes. Um, the foxes are harder, but there were no foxes this year. As far as we know, there were no great horned owls this year, but sometimes, um, we have bad luck anyway. And this year, um, a heron ate a bunch of turn eggs. And this is the first time that's happened. Um, there is a like killer black heron night heron that had a habit of going around taking eggs. Um, so um, yeah, they are not particularly good at any form of predation withstanding. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And that water snake, did he eat some baby turns or eggs? He, he totally could have. Yeah. The turns are very frustrating because they just um, are very unresilient. So sometimes we were mm -hmm. like, work with us, please. 
Try to survive. Yeah. So Corinne asks, what's the long-term goal of the project? Is it monitoring the overall population of turns, uh, common and least turns on poplar, or is there a more specific goal? Monitoring the populations of the common and least turns and the other water birds to generate data that we can show to the um, sources that make the continued funding for um, this project and conservation mm -hmm. efforts in the Chesapeake possible. It's basically, um, we, the onus is on us to show that it's working and worth their while by contributing to their recovery. Fabulous. Uh, Kathy Tyson asks, are the turn populations back to where they were before the island eroded? Probably not. We think that historically there were maybe like closer to 2,000 pairs of common turns on the island and 1,000 least turn pairs mm -hmm. um, and maybe some Forster's turns. Uh, these days, this summer it was about 600 common turn pairs and 400 least turn pairs, some of mm -hmm. which twice. So they um, might have had more offspring than that. Um, but definitely below historical numbers. And the Forster's turns only breed on adjacent islands now, but we're hoping they might come back too. Mm -hmm. Do you have to use a decoy or anything like that to lure them there to breed or they have established that as their breeding area now? They've mostly established it as their breeding area and they have a lot of fidelity to the places that they were born. They do mm -hmm. tend to come back year after year. Um, we put decoys out at the start of the season to lure them to specific sites that we believe will not have much construction interference. But mm. as far as I could tell, they did whatever they wanted and <laughs> they seemed to respond to the decoys. Yeah. Oh, John Farmer has a question. Oh, John Farmer has a comment. Thanks so much. Always good to have new experiences remotely and secondhand when not possible to experience them firsthand. You did a good job of covering the geography, history, and ecological reconstruction of the island. Thank you. Is there a concern about their food source in the future? That's from Jackie. I would say for turns in general, yes, because um, there have been shifts in the distributions of the fishes that the terns, um, in general, along the Atlantic, this isn't specific to the poplar terns, but all the terns that nest along the Atlantic, their um, food sources in general are changing, not necessarily meaning fewer fish, but just different fish. And they're not always even fish that the terns are able to swallow or feed to their young. Um, this has been a bigger issue further north, actually. Um, but changing climate equals changes in the fish distributions and the prey distributions, which is mm -hmm. definitely a concern. Mm -hmm. And in that same vein, I wondered whether you had any uh, issues with terns feeding plastic things to their babies or any of the babies getting uh, plastic in their digestive system. So there was nothing specifically that we noticed um, from this summer, but I definitely wouldn't take that as evidence that didn't happen. Um, I, I think that um, on the island itself, um, it was pretty controlled that there was not too much in the way of um, like trash because it was um, so actively monitored by like the construction workers as well. Um, I think they cared a lot about what was on the ground, um, but there definitely could have been issues with what the turns just picked up from the ocean and gave to their young. We were lucky enough that we didn't see that though. Did you, um... Did you make any assessments about which fish species they were feeding to their young? Or do you um, know which ones they were using? So we didn't do any um, specific analyses this summer about um, <clears throat> which um, fish were there, but there's actually been a bit of research in the past, um, like survey studies about like which terns are eating like which species in which amounts. And those studies are usually done 
by like examining the stomachs of dead birds that are found or historically more mm -hmm. likely shot. Um, so I'm trying to remember which species um, the commons and least each favored. Um, for common terns in the Chesapeake area, um, they ate a lot of these little fish called sand laces. Um, they ate a lot of herrings um, and um, little fish called silver sides. They also ate some crustaceans. Uh, we did see that they had crustaceans occasionally. Um, as for the least terns, um, they tended to take smaller fish unsurprisingly. So sometimes that would be like anchovies. And um, I think shiners were another big food source for them. Um, although I think shiners play an even bigger role for inland terns. Mm -hmm. um, Thank you, that's really interesting. Cool. <laughs> I'm always interested in all the little details about what they eat, whatnot. Other questions? Oh, were there green flies out there? Sue Clinton asks. Green flies? Is that a special kind of fly? Ooh, I'm not sure if I had green flies specifically. Um, there were some horse flies, but biting insects weren't too bad for the most part. Green flies are the curse of the Jersey Shore. Oh. They're flies and they come, um, if the wind is from the west, you're in trouble. If the wind is from the east, they're blown inland, but they really hurt when they bite you. <laughs> are they like I a sand fly? Ask. Pardon? A sand fly, are they? Sand flies? Yeah, but they, they are green because they have just a iridescent mm -hmm. greenness oh. about them. And if you are in a car driving, looking, they will come in and cling to the roof, inside roof, and then drop on you and then go back up. They're you know, really pestiferous. It sounds like I would have known if they were there. You would have known. <laughs> um, we did have, on the subject of insects, we had a single day where brood X cicadas got blown in. They were all over the Western shore in the, so like where I actually lived in Maryland was covered in brood X's for a solid month. And they mostly avoided poplar because there weren't trees there, but there was a single day where they all got blown in. It's Super wild. cool. We had a big, a nice big eruption of them in the Ann Arbor area at Marshall Park and out there at Cherry Hill Nature Area where we got a Mississippi kite hanging out for six weeks or so because of uh, the fact that it was eating brew 10 cicadas all day, <laughs> catching them in midair and stuffing them in his mouth. I also chased in Maryland a Mississippi kite eating brood X's. Yeah. <laughs> so they knew where it was at. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? That's all I see in the chat. Do, um, is there like a window where these chicks all hatch and is it, is it pretty tight? Can you talk a little bit about, about that? It comes in waves. Um, so um, there's sort of like a um, early ascent of when the terns lay their eggs in um, mid-May and then a whole bunch of them are laying in late May, which means that like the centered around like the third and fourth weeks of June, um, that's when there's like a big explosion. It's been like steadily building through June. And then we're banding like 80 or 100 chicks a day in the third and fourth weeks of June. And then it tails off after that, but there's usually a second smaller peak for the double nesters that either fail early in the season and try again, or just get it over with early and then try again. So we had a second peak in like mid July. Interesting. Do you have an idea of what the fledging rate was um, average per nest, which I mean, you know what I'm asking. I just don't yeah. want to say it properly. I have a, I have a pretty precise idea because this was part of what I had to go home and do. So let me see if I can find the data real quick. Um, mm -hmm. Let me see. You said the common terns average three eggs and the least average two. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, 
for for commenters. Okay, I have a couple of statistics for a uh, percentage of um, eggs that hatched. It looks like it was about sixty three percent for the common terns mm -hmm. and about um, sixty five percent for the least terns. And then let me see if I can find percentage that fledged out of the ones that hatched. Um, that might take me just a second though. <laughs> That's okay. If there's any other questions while I do that too. I'm oh, just thinking, oh, you got it? Yeah, um, about 62% of the common turns fledged and about <laughs> with least turns because they just get out of there. It's so hard to tell. And we didn't find a single dead least turn. So oh. as far as we know, all of them fledged, but it could have been as low as like 12%. So that statistic is not super helpful. <laughs> yeah. And that's of the, of the hatched. That's correct. Yeah. Interesting. Let's see if we have any other questions. While you're looking, when you were showing that picture of the mystery egret mm -hmm. egg and eggs, that one of those egg looks looked quite a bit different than the others. It was a lot darker, which is normal variation. Um, I noticed that too. Um, I think it was probably just a factor of normal variation. Like a lot of um, pigments somehow ended up in that egg. It's a little unusual to see that much variation in a single nest, but it, it does happen. Sure. You don't find those egrets are laying eggs in other species nests or other con specific nests. Not as far as I know anyway. Um, mm -hmm. it's, I wouldn't have known because it was pretty hard to identify the um, wader nests to species. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We had a couple of, um, especially when it wasn't one of the most common ones we had some spirited debates and looked in uh, like parent specific field guides to try to determine like, we know this is a little blue or a tri-colored, we do not know which one. That must be really difficult. Fun though. Mm -hmm. Other questions? We're, we're so grateful to you, Matt. And it was such an interesting and educational and fun uh, presentation and we really appreciate you giving it for us. Um, we hope you'll come back with another topic as soon as possible. <laughs> Looks like we have one other question there, Julia. Oh, another question. Corinne has raised her hand and then withdrawn it. Oh, I think she was- oh, sorry. There, there she is. I really enjoyed the presentation. Thanks, Matt. Thank you. Thank you all so much for coming and for uh, asking so many great questions. It's great to see everybody. It's great to see you too. Great to see everyone. Thank you. <sighs> we'll see you all soon. Don't forget to come next month for uh, Andy Johnson's program on Wimbro. Thanks, Matt. Matt. Thank you, Juliet. Thanks everyone for coming. <laughs>